I'm Xixo, I play for Na'Vi. I've been into the top eight for all three Insomnia tournaments, but both the last times I got quite unfortunate in the one of eight, so I never made it past that stage, so I really hope I get further this time. Every Insomnia had more players, I think, so I think that every player likes the venue here, likes how it's run, likes the format, which is last year's standing, which we all prefer. But to my opponents, I know they got quite unlucky already, queuing into me in the tournament. They could have gotten like way easier opponents. I hope they get slightly more fortunate in the game so they can maybe like take a game against me. I'm really happy to be through to top eight again. I'm pretty happy with my performance at Insomnia. There's a lot of good players in top eight now. I think I'm also a really good player and I think I can put up a really good fight against these players. They're world-class players, but I won the last one, so uh, I'm not too scared of them. I'd like to give a really big shout out to my teammate Ball Control and my team Torpedo. I practice all the time with Ball Control and my team, they always support me. The community here is great. Uh, players love to give tips to other players. So if someone's on stream, most of the players will be watching. These players are high class, they're like really good players. So they definitely know what's right. Yeah, welcome back. Great to hear a little bit more about Ness. Obviously, he's a player that I know pretty well, having you know been in UK tournaments with him, seen him around events. But it's great for other people to to get to know a guy that hasn't really had too much exposure outside of Insomnia events. Do you guys know anything about him? You obviously you've probably spoken to him here, but like, how does the the rest of Europe and the rest of the world view Ness? Is like he a player that people take seriously, or is he just you know some UK guy that's won some tournaments in the UK? Mm -hmm. I think at the very moment, I mean, he's. Uh, Kind of, um, I wouldn't say unique position, but a very special um, position, which is that he already proved himself in one major tournament, mm. which is usually very, uh, which is quite unusual that we have a player who is completely unknown, which proved himself in exactly one major tournament. So I guess it depends tremendously from the results he will be able to deliver from now on, mm -hmm. so, uh, whether he will be taken seriously or completely disregarded in the future. Orange, honestly, like you were in a, a very similar position early on in your career where you went from basically nothing to winning a major very, very quickly. Like, was there an expectation that you felt to like prove yourself again going forward? Uh, I definitely felt the pressure. Um, when I won my first major, there was just like so many people who were like, yeah, that this was just a fluke and oh, he has got lucky. And I felt like I really felt the need to prove myself uh, like again somehow. And I can, when Ness won last Insomnia, I was, I have to admit, I was kind of thinking the same thing. Right. Like after like following on social media and talking to him and like just interacting with him, I, I don't, he's not a fluke at all. This, mm -hmm. this player is really good. And I hope that the rest of the community will notice that when they see him play, because he is someone that I at least like come around on and like actually really do respect when it comes to Hofstein right now. And he's also, I'm a bit disappointed because I don't think he's bringing Priest this tournament, but, and he's very well known for being like a, very passionate priest player. Yeah, indeed. He was he was hoping for some help from from Karazan, and honestly, I spoke to him about the new priest cards, and he thinks you know the the new deck with Resurrex and Onyx, Bish Onyx bishops and just slamming a million blade masters in one game. Like he thinks that deck is is strong, but it's not it's not like fun for him. It's not how he wants to play priest. He enjoys like the pure control priest strategy, not like the mid range thing. So he still decided not to bring it to this tournament. But I would have loved to see a potential repeat from uh, repeat victory from Priest just to shut up the haters and say, no, Priest has won two Insomnias in a row now. Like, this class is real. <laughs> Have you guys messed around with any of the new cards, uh, the Resurrect stuff, Onyx Bishop, any of those cards in Priest? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't believe that much in Priest, to okay. be honest. So um, I guess even if it would be viable, I let others prove first sure. and then jump, just jump on the train. Orange Priest player at all? Uh, I'd, I'd actually do play more Priest than people. Like, people definitely do not know me for my Priest play, but I actually do play it quite a lot. And I did try Priest a bit in testing, but I, I tried like all different versions of it, and I couldn't really find one. I find lists that were good, but like the power level of the strong decks right now in the format are so strong, and like Priest can still not really compare to that, even though it got some good upgrades with the Karasa. Sure. So finally, looking at the class lineup here and the bands, we're seeing Rogue Druid Paladin come up against Warrior Druid Warlock with Shaman banned from both sides. Uh, Orange, I think we'll start with you on this one. How do you feel about the the, the, the double Shaman ban, and who do you think has the edge in terms of lineups here? Uh, I, I actually I'm quite surprised about the Shaman ban because right. when I played in the tournament, uh, the only time someone banned anything else but my warrior was actually against War Control, Ness teammate. 
uh, and he won against me. So I feel like uh, maybe these guys are onto something. Like Sixo doesn't even have Warrior in his lineup, which yep. has been like the most popular deck to ban throughout the whole tournament, as far as I can tell. So uh, I am really interested to see how how this goes. Shaman has also proven to be like a very very strong class just for a very long time now. So uh, I, I don't blame them at all for banning the deck. And also. One of the Druid's bad matchups that uh, uh, that they know now the Druid is like even better than it uh, was. Sure. Before. Well, we are. Looks like we're ready to get into the game, and we're going to start things out with a Druid mirror. So I will hand you guys over, and I'm personally looking forward to listening to this to the to the capable hands of Orange and Life Coach to talk you through this game. Enjoy, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so. We have two very beautiful starting hands here in the <laughs> Druid Mirror. I mean, we all know that uh, a lot comes down to this wild growth uh, in Druid, and both players have just access to that. So that will be very interesting. Yeah, it's really good to see, because like some games can just be a steamroll when uh, one player has the ramp in the wild growth, so it like, gets a uh, super explosive, nourish start off. But here we see both of them have it, having access to that. And Six is looking at a really nice curve of Wild Growth into Fanarul and Asher Drake, whereas uh, Ness has the double Wild Growth in hand. Yeah. So th th this should uh, not be decided in the early game at all, which I feel like sometimes through it, the mirror just comes down to like the earliest Wild teacher, and the other guy doesn't have anything really. So. Right. Whereas we already see also a Fenrir and the Myro Keeper in Sixth's hand, and I really have to say that is kind of explosive. So um, if you know Myro Keeper is here, and let's say next turn he can develop the the Ezra Drake, and then maybe Fenrir into two really big cards, two Fenrir cards, that could be really really huge here. Absolutely. How, how I want, how I like playing Fenrir this matchup is like uh, Druid actually has a lot of problem dealing with a three-five on uh, on turn like three, or if you innovate it out or something like that. So I like going for the early Fanrul Wild Teacher, even if I can't back it up with something. But if you got better options like Meyer Keeper, and you can save the Fanrul to get like a, either you just play it on six with like a Living Roots or a Wrath, or if you, at the three you missed it in the late game, get it off with Nourish, of course. Uh, but I really like the decision here of going with Meyer Keeper yeah. first. We also here have here a small bug with the with the display. So oh yeah, perfect. Yep. <laughs> there we go. And uh, Ness matches this Wild Growth uh, Mire Keeper start uh, like, uh, as good as you can, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's like with his own double Wild Growth and uh, the trees are still in play, so... Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, we will probably see uh, an Ezric now coming down now, uh, drawing these Fendral cards and then we can just have Fendral into infinite activation. We see a Moonfire here. Uh, so that means that uh, the Rat, uh, American player, uh, posted a list yesterday that was a Malagos uh, druid that he just claimed that this is the best deck in the format and it's not close. So I think Sixo playtest with that group of people quite a lot, so I would expect there is something similar to what uh, the rat posted on uh, Twitter yesterday. All right. I mean, uh, the deck this, uh, submission was a few weeks ago, so I guess um, maybe it's overlapping, but I guess this um, has a lot to do with the uh, release of Barnes, because Barnes also kind of enables uh, also running Maligos in your deck, and that kind of enables also to run Moonfires in your deck, and then you can run it with Auctioneers, without Auctioneers. I mean, the list you have in mind is probably with Auctioneers, or...? Uh, the no. one he posted was without. Uh, without, okay. mm. So I'm gonna expect that. Uh, one thing I want to talk about, which is like really interesting when uh, he has the Moonfire Maligos kind of deck, is that it puts uh, like the roles in the matchup gets very different. This means that Sixo is uh, the aggressor, so to speak. None of these decks are aggressive. It, like it's not an aggressive deck at all. But uh, Sixo has to be the one to uh, like kind of apply pressure and try to set up the Malgos combo as uh, like pretty quick because uh, Ness will have the late game advantage if there's no combo to be seen it, in the way of having cards like Arcane Giant and uh, stuff like that, whereas Sixo instead has the combo finish. There's probably Arcane Giant Sixo's decks too, but Ness' deck is more focused on playing a really long grinding game. 
Right, but talking uh, about combo finish, I mean, the Maligos doesn't only serve the role of being a combo finisher, right? I mean, if you have a Moonfire which converts into six damage, I mean, that might be fine on the face, but um, nine mana and two cards for six damage is not fine at all. So mm -hmm. I guess a lot of it also has to do um, of just playing Maligos with a Moonfire, but if he stays on the board, maybe you can then make this swipe happen for nine damage in the face, six damage on yeah. all minions. Yeah, that's pretty good too. Yeah. Um Th that that's absolutely true, and we see uh, Sixer here going for the Fandral now on, on an empty board for uh, Ness, which is great because Ness is going into his turn seven, yep. which is usually the where you just want to slam down Ancient of War and see if the opponent has mulch. But staring down a Fandral, Ness can't really do that. He needs to leave the Fandral uh, instead of playing a threat of his own, which keeps uh, like the initiative on Sixer's side. Yeah, I also have to say that um, uh, with the uh, um with the Fenrir up, I mean, we see that Sixo doesn't have access to too many Fenrir cards, but uh, Ness obviously doesn't know that. Um, so yeah, we will see what he will decide to play. He might just go for the Feral Rage and Shape Shift, but that also means that he has kind of a dead turn, so I don't like that at all. But yeah, I mean... You, you, might, you might feel pressured into doing that. I, this is one of the few situations where I feel like maybe not dealing with the Fenrir is the correct play, and just yep. playing the Ancient of War anyway. But in, in Ness... Ness mind, he's so afraid of like a mulch coming down to get a, like a nourish into a mulch or something along those lines. And as I say that, we oh. see that card drawn from six right away. That's super big. It's really, oh my god. This is going to be an interesting turn. Lots of things <laughs> are going to happen here. It is so huge and so powerful. Two, four, six, eight, nine. So he, yeah, yeah he, he just he, play he, a lot of good cards. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we start off with Draven Idol because we're not yep. overdrawing from two extra cards. And we can take pretty expensive cards here because we're also holding double Innervate. So 6 0. Yeah, but I guess it's two, <laughs> pretty much anything here. Yeah, it, it, they are all not that good cards. Maybe, I don't even know. Maybe the boy is it, still the best one. The, 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 yeah, I, I, th I think it is. <laughs> Definitely not very impressive. He picks up the power of the wild here. That's huge because yeah. you can you can combine it immediately with the Fender. So, Power of the Wild uh, seeing play now, now Living Root. Uh, also setting up um, to um, get the Power of the Wild to flourish on four minions. It's just super insane. And even seeing the Feral Rage coming down, and it's, a, it's just such a crazy turn. Yeah, th this is uh, this is exactly what uh, Sixo Sixo wanted. That he drew that nourish there, there was really fortunate, uh, and he made the best out of his turn. The next turn, I if uh, Ness doesn't deal with all of this, he even has solo. Oh, back huge top deck! Oh, yeah. huge top deck that here. Um, deals exactly with the Fender. Beforehand, he didn't have any kind of way to deal uh, deal with the Fender unless he is uh, prepared to shapeshift and take the four damage here. But the swipe is changing it completely. Now he can just, for example, teacher into swipe, which is kind of pretty good. Yeah, you get you get a one one that uh, deals with one of the trees if uh, Sixer doesn't hero power, which mm. I don't, I wouldn't expect him to do when he just drew three cards out of Nourish and got uh, twice the value out of the Raven Idols. I like uh, teacher into swipe very much here. Yeah, same. I would still say that Sixer is in an amazing spot. I think the, this might come down to the Arc Fifra farm that uh, Sixer picked up from the first Raven Idol. I think that will be a very, very big play in this game. And the only thing that can really match that is actually the Jog sitting in the Ness hand. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, right? I mean, mummies are nice, but mummies are not only half as nice if your opponent has a Jog in their hand. With a lot of spells already being deployed, and there will be a Fender into Fur Rage into Power of the Wild uh, coming down next to him before the Jog. And uh, the mummies will also need at least two turns. Uh, there's, all, uh, by the way, an auction here, yeah. so that's awesome. Apparently plays it, and uh, right now he definitely has the support to draw a couple of cards if he's interested in that. There's six is the one applying pressure, so it's not like he has to look for answers yet with Auctioneer. So I could, I could very well see him uh, playing something but Auctioneer, but then again, passing up on, a, on this good of an Auctioneer turn. Nourish Ron. Yeah. Okay. He goes for solo the forest. Oh, oh that's he also a huge draw there with the Arcane Giant. He can play that in the same turn and now have an auctioneer that he must deal with and also just a big 8 8 giant. I also am wondering a little bit about the list. I mean, because Tixo uh, managed to fit in the Arcane Giant, managed to fit in Moonfires. 
managed to fit in still nourish and an aug and auctioneers probably Maligos too so I'm really really curious what he cut it in his list yeah I ha have you seen ancient war yet I mean he can only play that many big minions like auctioneer kind of counts as a high-end minion mm -hmm. so I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't any ancient wars in this deck but that also plays right into what I said earlier that like six is trying to uh, play for a little bit more aggressive game plan than other druids by right. by applying pressure early on. Mm -hmm. Oh, we <laughs> see a mulch here. I mean, yeah. mulch should be pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely think you picked the mulch here. This is a good final turn for uh, Nest on the other hand. Yeah, mulch is good, but he won't... He may probably not use it. He will probably use the power of the Wild Feral Rage in this... Uh, yeah, probably those two in this turn, and the mulch later on. That's perfectly fine. Exactly. Now you definitely want to play the cards which you can activate now, which you should. Terror Rage, Power of the Wild, definitely play here. Um, Hero Kids, Auctioneer, awesome. He might run out of time though, is he roping? I, I, I think he has time to do all of this, it's just the queues, yep. queues up the action at the same time. Okay. The rope is burning, I can see it. Sixer still gets a 2-2 a out of this Auctioneer though, so he has 14, uh, 12 power on board okay. and... Uh, he only, the only must deal with threat is the Fandral on board, so this could be a pretty good push for Sixo if it decides to go for it. Or, I mean, he, has, he just has so many options. He can either choose to just go for the aggressive line of, uh, of killing Fandral with, say, Swipe and, and a Tree Ant and play Emperor, or he could uh, just trade the Arcing Giant into Fandral and play an Arc Thief for a farm. There are so many things he can do here. But I, I do think I like this line the best. Yeah. Still two giant threats on board, and uh, getting a discount on Nourish and Dark Fee for a farm uh, could, could be huge. Yeah, definitely strong. Also maybe already baiting out the Yogg here. I mean, on an 8 and a 5-5, Yogg is definitely a very, very good deploy. And let's see what it does. Anything? Nothing. Forgotten Torch? Shuffles a uh, Torch in your deck, so that's pretty good too. That's um, good. Love oh. Birth. Oh, oh, that's, that's oh, great. Oh, man. Oh, prep. Oh, so huge. And Okay, whatever. Oh, that's also such a huge card. So, uh, secret everything. All of all of the things are very, very good cards for him. Okay, that, oh, that that's a bit unfortunate. Now he can't. Nice wreck uh, on. Ah, yes, on a Strato and March. Okay, fair enough. And the March only being able because of the preparation here. So, it's a pretty damn good New York. Not not the very best, but definitely solid. I, I would definitely not be sad if I on this end like. A lot of the time, that Jog does not kill both uh, both threats on board, but that actually did. He had to use the mulch in his hand, but he, he can't be unhappy. His opponent had an 8 and a 5 on board, and mm. now instead he, he is the one. Yeah, I also think so. I mean, he, he got two minions, he got a trap, he drew a card. Pretty good Jog. Absolutely. Now from 6 -2. you saw mulch use, and I've been talking about this Arc Fever farm for a long time, but I think yeah. it's finally time to play it. Oh yeah, I think so too. <laughs> uh, maybe it's maybe, time for this fight now. <laughs> <laughs> Things has just changed. It, nourish and swipe is a pretty good line if the trap was snake trap. Yeah, you probably draw three cards and swipe. But you see that Sixo stops out and f uh, stops up and thinks because he was planning on playing Dark for a foul this turn, but now it's way closer. Yeah, yeah. I would definitely go for the swipe here. Yeah. I don't see that you can ever do the Arc Thief. If you play the Arc Thief here, you just give free trades from the boar, for example. Oh, no, I mean, he will moonfire the boar. Mm -hmm. But it's still pretty tricky. Um, Ness will be able to utilize these one ones. So I guess Nourish and Swipe is the good uh, play to go here. But uh, Ness is like kind of low on cards and uh, already and already used his jog, so grinding Ness out in uh, in this sort of game by just like answering his uh, threats like one by one is definitely not a bad bad game plan to go for in this situation for Sixo. Yeah, but I'm also not sure because I mean, I, of course the Azadrake changes uh, the entire thing, but you can also, and Ness will also be able to cycle a tremendous amount of mana into this combatant as well, and he still has the Raven Idol which will also provide him an additional card draw, so I guess Ness won't run out of cards for the next probably three or four turns here. Oh, no, no, he, def he definitely has gas left. That's the strength of the Druid just as a class right now, that it has so much late game power. And uh, we were trying to, in testing, we were trying to build like slow decks that could potentially grind the uh, uh, Druid out, but we never found any deck that were capable of that. Yeah. But uh, in, the, in the Druid Mirror, it's like the one matchup. If uh, one player draws the double nourish and the other one doesn't, you, uh, 
can get a big advantage that way. And uh, this is like with quite a lot of minions in hand. Not bad ones. So the, the combatants, as you said, are gonna be pretty big. Especially if you can play both in the same turn and kill, say something, yeah, like an auctioneer. Yeah, it's also, yeah, I mean, both combatants and shapeshift <laughs> delivering five damage from the hero Parallon, and that's a pretty big deal. Um, I would assume that Arctiv will be simply too slow in this game. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's probably not... Uh, Arctiv is probably a dead card by now because it's really only about the tempo. I mean, maybe maybe it comes, but um, even then, it's probably mainly about the tempo. Because if Ness doesn't win, let's say, in the next two or three turns, she will, as you rightly said, um, simply run out of cards. And then it really doesn't matter whether you have these five, six, seven mummies still on the board or, or not. You see him go for Dark Thief anyway, mm -hmm. just as I said, I expect the mummies to be the card to be picked here. Time piece of horror. Uh, okay, no, <laughs> never mind, never mind. <laughs> Poor time piece of horror. No, no. Never been discovered ever. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever see um, another discover than the mummies? Uh, I, I mean, I've seen a Lantern of Insight against opponents that been on like 15 ish health because okay. then any minion left on board is just uh, a lethal threat. Right. But when your opponent is at uh, 23, I think the choice is almost always the timepiece. Yep. Uh, no, the Mirror of Doom. <laughs> and uh, Ness realizes that in this spot he cannot really deal with the Arc Thief, so instead he has to try to flood the board with the minions he has in hand and go for a more aggressive game plan. But he forfeited damage, right? If he would have played the combatant, he would have delivered two more phase damage, and that's pretty... I, I think it's pretty important. Um, but uh, if, if he does that, his next turn, he can't spend as many as much mana efficiently if he uh, if he deals... if he plays one combatant in one turn and one in the other. That's, like, more efficient mana usage for him. If he plays both combatants here, his next turn could just be Mire Keeper, Leopard Gnome, and that's pretty weak, depending on what he draws. No, it's, uh, it's exactly the same, right? I mean, he can play the combatant now, shape shift. it's exactly the same. He just plays, instead of the four mana drop, he just plays the other four mana yeah. drop, delivers two more damage immediately. If um, your opponent cannot deal with double combatant, it's simply two more damage. If he can deal with double combatant, it's uh, the same damage. Yeah, it's the same amount of damage, but this way he gets to split it up. He gets to split the, up, like, three damage to the face this turn, and next turn he might want to split three damage on, uh, on something else, like an auctioneer, for example. And uh, if he plays both combatants, uh, they might both die, and then he only has a hero power for one damage next turn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So only if your opponent will be able to really kill both combatants, then it's basically the same. Yeah, yeah. And if he only kills one, it's more. Um, so here we have an innovator run by Ness, which is basically a blank. That's yeah. It's really something he didn't want to see. Um, but I guess he just goes for it. Yeah, just this one, Lepernorm, Shapeshift, Face, and then just. Hope for the best. Uh, uh, maybe shapeshift auction here, but I guess if you do that, you can probably not win anymore. N n yeah, Ness is in a horrible spot here. I think he has to kill auctioneer, but just as you say, this is this is a, this is a losing battle. There is no way really coming back from this. Six is just sitting there with a six card hand, where you know that one of them is the ten mana haymaker spell you get from the arc thief. This game is uh, just going through the motions at this point. Interestingly, the boy from Ramshield uh, plays. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's at uh, 13. I think Sixo is uh, trying to figure out if they're like, in what ways could uh, Ness get like, what if he maybe expects this as an innovator in Ness hand and he draws a nourish, uh, get some weird combination of cards that can kill him if he doesn't play safe enough. Exactly. I mean, I'm also wondering how many cards Kixo still has in his deck, because um, whether uh, or not to kill the auctioneer is heavily, hugely dependent on the cards remaining in Kixo's deck. So if he has, let, let's say, um, eight or less decks, uh, cards in his deck, it was definitely incorrect uh, to kill the auctioneer, because um, not killing it would have meant um, Kixo goes fast and fatigue, and the, the value from the additional cards is basically nearly zero. Um, yeah. And we see here he's reaching for the Feral Rage and, and like super safe trade. Here comes the Bull, Mire Keeper, and uh, I would say that this, with the Feral Rage as a backup, just just locks it up. Okay, swipe. So, swipe deals 5 on Bolf. 
Um, that means, uh, yeah, he can basically kill both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's not ideal, but whatever. It does not even matter whether he swipes. Yeah, okay, he can also do it like this. Then he leaves both up. Well, Fram Shield gets his uh, time in the spotlight here. Not a oh, card, yeah. not, not a card we see very often, but Raven Idol leads to some very interesting situations, to say the least. Yes. All of this happening, and Ness still knows that there's a Mirror of Doom. I mean, he expects it to be a Mirror of Doom, at least in uh, Sixo's hand. So, if he takes this line, yeah, he should do it like this. That is better. Oh, there's even a Yogg in there. <laughs> okay, so everything, yeah, okay. Yeah. I would not be surprised to see the Mirror of Doom coming down. Trading into this race 3, Mirror of Doom, GG. The, the turn. This, is, this is definitely the turn uh, you want a Mirror of Doom because yep. uh, ev even if you're, you're, you're in a huge advantage here, but you also, you can't just give it Ness in infinite time. You want yep. to close out the game mm -hmm. I I if you can afford to. I definitely agree. And what is it, 11 damage? It's also pretty impossible with two cards to be dealt. So, yeah, you really don't have any any problem here at all. Um, there we go. Game one goes to 6-0 so in, in the Druid Mirror, which is actually, uh, for me, as far as I, I've been talking to the players um, that have been playing this tournament, and everyone seems to agree that, like, Jog Druid has been the absolute most dominant deck. And in, like, we, we have seen some dominant decks throughout the days, but this Jog Druid, is like has been the huge factor in most series uh, that people have played, which is scary when you lose the Jog Druid because that means that well your opponent still gets to play the best deck in the format, whereas you are stuck with uh, decks that may not be as powerful. Yeah, I mean I definitely agree here. Um, but that being said, I guess um, uh, Jog Druid being so predominant doesn't necessarily mean it's the best deck, but it probably means it's the second best deck, right? Because um, one deck will see the ban, and that's usually exactly not Druid, but Shaman or Warrior. So there's an argument to be made that um, Face Shaman is just tier one or the number one deck, but uh, directly followed by Yogg Druid. Yeah, I, I could uh, I could get behind that uh, Face Shaman could be better than uh, Jog Druid possibly, but I actually don't I don't think that the ban on Warrior comes from Warrior being that strong. The warrior decks are def definitely really, really strong. But that why, why I, why me and my playtesting group chose to go with the warrior ban was at least because the warrior decks could be so many different types of powerful decks. Mm -hmm. You have the dragon warrior, that's like a kind of a mid-range curve out deck that's really powerful. You have the you have these type of control warriors that are strong, and you also have the OTK warriors. And just uh, uh, designing a lineup that could beat all of these warriors uh, was so complicated that instead we felt like the other decks were easier to prepare for and therefore we wanted to go with the warrior ban. But I can definitely see that uh, maybe Face Shaman is a stronger deck than Jog Druid, but myself, I think that some sort of uh, slower Druid, if it's Malagos Rogue or if it's uh, or if it's the slow Jog Grindy Druid, I, I think that's the strongest deck at the moment. Yeah, I can definitely uh, get behind that. Um, but that being said, the Druid will see some change probably within uh, this week already because we saw the, also the Beast Keeper coming out, so now they're really an awesome lot of uh, <laughs> different kind of Druids, which is the Beast Druid with the, um, um, with the manager, manager for 6 mana, which gives you 10-10. Um, we see Yogg Druid still, but we see also this uh, a spe a Spell Druid or Yogg Druid with a Giant, or a Spell Druid with Moonfires and Maligos and Barns. Um, if it even plays Barns, but I would naturally assume so. So we have all kind of Druids here as well nowadays. Absolutely. Um, six zero. Pretty pretty slow start here, but uh, if there's a matchup where you can afford to have a pretty slow start, it's against these uh, type of control wars because they really do not apply any pressure to you early on. But just lets you set up uh, your game plan and uh, they try to yeah grind you out. Well, I guess um, the warrior tries to fatigue the druid and. I can definitely see a lot of success rate here because um, 
you see that the Yocturi plays also a lot of um, cards which has very low value themselves. Um, Moonfire, Terror Rages, I mean, they just yeah, deliver four attacks, so that's not huge. And the cards which are usually problematic for the Control Warrior side are cards like Soul of the Forest, um, cards like Onyxia, which flooding the board, but um, there is nothing of this in Xixus deck, and direct damage with the Maligos is also not really that promising against any kind of warrior. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. The, the one way the Dru Druid tries to win this matchup is by we're just overwhelming uh, uh, the warrior with card advantage early on. Like it tries to get the uh, it, the warrior cannot cycle as much as the druid can. So if the druid can uh, get ahead by just the sheer amount of cards it has available to it early on, like the warrior might run out of cards before you reach fatigue. Yeah, I also think that's a game plan. So druid tries to cycle his entire deck as soon as possible, and perhaps he's strong enough to get um, Warrior out of answers, but well, yep. usually that doesn't happen. Oh, it's even, exactly. it's even the uh, uh, Nezoth Warrior, right? Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, Nezoth, as a card, I think, is a very underrated way of uh, beating the Druids. Because oh, yeah. Druid doesn't have like any good board sweeper, so I yep. if you're not under too much pressure at the time, uh, uh, at the time when you can play Nezoth with like a couple of minions against Druid, that most of the time means game. So. Th this type of war should de definitely be very favored against the uh, Sixers deck. At yeah, least that's yeah. how I feel. Yeah, definitely agree there. Also, keep in mind um, there is um, there there is Barnes, and Barnes is giving so many minions, uh, so, so many good copies. If the yeah. Torrent gets copied, it's just insane. Sylvanas, um, um, yeah, the Torrent, which has already seen draw, but um, yeah, Cairn, of course. And um, also Ragnaros doesn't um, doesn't damage too much. Okay, one one Grom is not that exciting, but um, we also have to keep in mind that it's not only about this one one which death rattles for a, a control a minion or for a four or five bane, but it's also that they all count towards Nezot too. Yeah, th that is, that is huge. Um, and now now Six starts with um, with the game plan that Druid has in mind. He just starts trying that his first big threat uh, asks Ness basically, do you have the answer for this? And then, uh, then the following couple of turns is gonna play fret after fret after fret. And yep. if uh, Ness ever runs out of uh, efficient removal spells, uh, th those are gonna carry six. So, but so far, uh, Ness is holding both an execute and a brawl that could both be useful for dealing with uh, with frets. Or the brawl is not that efficient if uh, six so is conservative with his frets. But the execute is a great start to this. Mm -hmm. I would definitely go with the fiery warrix on the eight eight and execute it and play the torrent. Uh, well, the small tower, <laughs> um, simply because, um, well, the Justica might create four armor, but he also takes a lot of damage in this course of action, and also, uh, and the giant can also trade beneficially into the four five. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I would uh, really like to see the Warax execute uh, turn there. Uh, this way, th there are, I guess, uh, Ness tries to deal with this arcing giant without us using his very valuable execute. But there are just so many efficient ways for Druid with all of its removal spells to deal with uh, to deal with these minions from Ness. So it's a very optimistic thought, thinking that uh, either I mean uh, that just it definitely Yasuko is not going to stay in play, and uh, kind of optimistic to think that the Karen is too. I think. Okay, we see a swipe and living roots maybe. It's pretty expensive, but yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I like using Living Roots here. You have the Malagos in hand, so the Moonfire is definitely not uh, a dead card by any means. And uh, your hand is really, really mana-hungry, so you want to use it as efficiently as possible. Yeah, but keep also in mind that Living Roots uh, represents the 7 damage with the Malagos, right? And yeah, yeah. that really aligns very well with the Malagos. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm not sure. One mana deals 7 damage mm, sounds kind of good to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, zero mana, six damage. Also, yeah. that's very great. Korhal, uh, I want to talk about this card. This oh wow! Is like, yeah, this is uh, this is a huge draw. Uh, he's kind of sad that he's stuck with. Uh, if he chooses to play the Gorhal here, he's kind of sad that he's stuck with both Fire Warax in hand for a yeah. long time. They're gonna mm -hmm. be dead. But Gorhal is certainly a very key piece for Warrior in this matchup. Oh yeah. Because uh, as we said, the Druid has more card draw than the Warrior, so just answering one by one, you are eventually gonna find yourself in a situation where uh, the Druid just like plays a threat and you don't have an answer. But Gorhal changes that completely. Gorhal can deal with several big threats on its own. It's great against the Asher Drakes, against the Emperor. Um, 
and the auctioneers. I would also yeah. just one card and deal with so many threats from Druid and make up for the loss in card advantage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would definitely agree. And also uh, the hero power and the tank up. I mean, uh, the bra becomes way way better if you have a gohal in play because um, the opponent can uh, not do exactly what you just described, playing one by a uh, minion by one, and warrior has to handle those. But now Druid has to deploy one minion, maybe uh, two minions, maybe even three minions, or flooding the board in some other way, and then the brawl will strike tremendously. And this, the entire thing is even uh, better and bigger because of the tank up, and that increases again the brawl value because the Druid has to create so much more board in order to threaten something. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a great point. Now, if Sixo doesn't, yeah, just doesn't play enough cards, uh, Ness can just sit back and watch while his score house does all the work. Mm -hmm. That is going to be a sheep arcing giant. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think that uh, he will commit it here. We all already seen Sixo be very conservative with uh, with not playing enough threats yeah. on the board at any given time. Great play by Sixo. I really like uh, how he's been playing this matchup so far. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, so I think Ness played it uh, very well up to this point too, except that maybe that execute turn where he played just the car instead. Uh, but Six is really showing that he understands this ma matchup uh, very, very well. Okay, so now... Hmm, interesting. And you might even... Mm -hmm. Hmm. Play Gromash on the 4-4 four, four Dragon. Oh, okay. oh, he's going for a way riskier line. I, I think I I like the Gromash line. You're still at the for the health field. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what I get for saying that. <laughs> That's pretty damn good. Ah, that's, that's insane. That that is uh, pretty absurd. We can we can talk a little bit about about this because this uh, this gives six the information that Ness felt the need to go for such a risky line as Infested Torrent plus Brawl yep. uh, shows Sixo that uh, Ness feels very threatened right now and he has to take like these big risks mm -hmm. uh, to win the game. And uh, yeah, we see that from Sixo. He like immediately yep. just plays two other threats because Ness didn't have any better way to deal with this than uh, than that risky brawl. So, well, I guess a brawl in this situation would always, <laughs> it would always tell me that uh, Ness is sitting on a second brawl <laughs> because otherwise he would usually probably uh, not, not not be inclined as much to uh, to. I'm, I'm not saying wasting it. It was not a waste. It was okay, but um, now he's really out of ways to handle a big board flood. So yeah, I'm really not sure. Yeah, and no, I definitely agree with that. But uh, now, see, seeing how he actually went for that line and got rewarded, even as much as we might disagree with it, he's actually in a pretty good spot here. Oh, yeah. He, he gets to kill both threats. The Gorahal is still at five health. He's holding two giant minions. And also, if he can get uh, that Acolyte to like draw him two cards, see if he plays uh, yep. get on an Acolyte in the same turn later on. Um, I think that um, this was exactly what Ness needed to have a fighting chance in this game. Oh, yeah. How much damage is it in Six of Hand, actually? We have 12 plus... It's 19 no, it's, with the Malagas. Oh, it's more. It's more, right? It's like um, 4, 19, 23. Does he have 23 damage with the Feral Rage? Oh, yeah, right. Feral Rage. You can cost that, too. Oh, he's going for it. Okay. I. So this is a two-turn two game plan. Uh, Six who plays the Malagos with all the spells, and next turn his opponent's going to be really low, and there's not going to be much of a board left. And maybe even Malgo sticks. Like, th this is a threat that Ness needs to deal with. And yeah. there's even gonna, there's going to be a very small board or no board at all. And then Jogstron is quite likely to uh, clean this up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I, I haven't kept count on how many spells, but all I can say is there's a lot of spells <laughs> that have been played so far this game from Six of Side. And even if he runs out of gas, he can still use the auction to draw the cards with white cards. But I'm not. I'm really not sure. I mean, maybe maybe auctioning and drawing three cards could have also been a way to even squeeze out a little bit more value from money. Because I mean, it was tremendously good value. So probably not saying so anything about that. But yeah. and so what is this? <laughs> it's, it's not looking very. I mean, uh, uh, by the way, it's not lethal, right? I mean, if he just tanks up, it's uh, not lethal. I have no time for games. No, it's not the on board. Which is pretty uh, funny, right? <laughs> and I mean, Sixer used most spells at this point, but... Uh, oh. oh! I can't imagine. I think he has a swipe left. I don't think we've seen both being used. 
And uh, I don't think we've seen both Raven Idols either, so... Oh, this oh. is... Oh, really? With a uh, Sylvanas oh, or two. If Sylvanas gets killed, that would be so absurd. The, the, the Yogg is glowing. Oh, okay, okay. No, no danger there now. But if he would have lost the Yogg, that would have been so crazy. Yeah. Oh, what does he have left? Is he already going in 50? Oh, he's already going in 50. Oh my god. He has to draw a lot of Oh my, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. What is... Ah, oh, sick. Okay. <laughs> okay, that, that, that sees the deal. <laughs> that was scary for a, for a second there. Yeah, three really like how six would play that. Uh, he shows that uh, he shows that he is uh, to be like that. People should uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, um, that was a very interesting consideration. Sixo uh, realized correctly that he didn't have any direct damage left in his deck, and he also realized correctly that uh, he cannot play the York four turns later because then he would just overdraw into complete big fatigue. So he just um, played his odds and uh, tried out this York, um, just in the hope to deal some face damage, and it turned out to be successful. Um, it's really absurd because if he wouldn't have been able to deal this uh, necessary damage in this very turn, he probably would have very likely lost this game. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That was uh, when Sixo played the Malagos. That was his all-in play. If I don't win the, if I don't win the game on the following turn, Ness is just gonna start stabilizing, closing it out. But he also had to realize that what he had to do in that situation. I, I think uh, a lot of people would just like try to p play other things and wait with uh, Malagos as long as you could. Mm -hmm. um, now, <laughs> now it's really interesting because Ness has to win all those three next games and this is not even the biggest challenge because we still see the Rogue from Sixo. Mm -hmm. So the Rogue from Sixo will represent the biggest challenge for Ness. It's not even about this game now. And this matchup, I, I feel like uh, Sue is... Uh, uh, this is a matchup where Sue is considered favored, but I don't even know if that's the case anymore because Sixos uh, Druid does have the double feral rage, like really efficient to deal with the uh, councilmans and the uh, Imkang boss that mm -hmm. is posed a big problem to uh, uh, to the Druid, and also uh, Sixo has the Moonfires to deal with uh, pesky stuff like uh, abusive that you can't really that are like annoying to deal with if you don't have the swipe or those cards. So. Six's build of Druid should be way better geared towards beating Sue than uh, mo the standard Druid that we see from most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I tend to disagree a little bit here. I mean, um, I, I definitely agree, like what you said, that Moonfire is tempo and Feral Rage is also tempo, but it does come with a cost, and the cost, are in both cases, uh, a card, and in the case of Feral Rage, also a big life commitment. So, um, given that this is usually about the race, uh, I mean, about the race, but that Druid will usually fight to uh, stay alive and struggle until turn 8, turn 9, and if he survives, then he usually wins. Um, I don't believe that Feral Rage and Moonfire are really effective ways to swing this game into a favorite position for yourself, especially if you also need to use these Moonfires. You might simply also run out of cards and then um, get outvalued by the zoo even. So these are also things to be considered. Yeah, Life Tap is a very powerful ability that you should be careful uh, when you run into it like any Warlock deck, just mm -hmm. because uh, even if it's just a deck filled with small minions, you can still very easily get grinded out. Um, one one more thing that uh, actually solid solidifies your point even more is that uh, the, the the biggest cost, I think, for running the Feral Rage and the Moonfire mm -hmm. is we haven't seen Ancient of War, and that is a huge card right. in this matchup. Right. Uh, so even if he has like these good early game cards, he's actually missing uh, the best late game card you can have in the matchup. Yeah, also saying that the deck is incredibly greedy too, right? I mean, we, yeah. we see a Maligos, Maligos is not doing nothing against Zoo. Uh, it, it should do nothing against Zoo. And um, we see Thorson, which is kind of slow. We see Double Auction near, which is like a turn 8, turn 9 deploy, which is also very silly. Um, so a lot of, even York, even York creates a lot of value, but um, if you're dead by the time you get um, access to this value, that's not ideal. Okay, yeah, you, 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 you convinced me. I, I side with you on this one. This is probably still quite favored for this, the Sue. Ness having uh, the draw you kind of want as the, um, as the Sue. The, the big thing in this matchup is that Druid has a very hard time to deal with your free drops. Both Councilman and Imkang Boss are 
a real pain uh, yeah. to, to deal with for uh, this deck, and they get to coin one into the other, and also has these <laughs> double uh, double knife jugglers as a follow up. Makes it uh, mm. not not a great position for Sixo to play Emperor in. Uh, he, um, does he cycle? Yeah. Uh, no, I think he kills it. Uh, just because of okay. power, Moonfire. Okay. It's expensive. I mean, this is basically the case, right? I mean, we, Moonfire costed the cards. It's very expensive, you also need to shape shift, takes another portion of damage, so yeah. Looks like Sixo's uh, real game plan is to get, play the turn 9 jog, uh, going by this line of play. Uh, this way he still gets to play Emperor in the next turn, get the discount on jog, mm -hmm. which he can hopefully turn the game around with on turn 9. Oh, we see a Doomguard coming down here, I'm not sure about that one. I would have liked to tap, what do you think? Mm, I think I like to tap myself too, mm -hmm. uh, it, it just seems better. And here we see that that is definitely what he's going for. He's not playing the 8-8, eight, eight, but instead Emperor on uh, this yep. turn, just mm -hmm. just so he can play the Jog on turn 9. Okay. Those are some pretty good draws. Um, forbidden Ritual, especially because uh, when Jog comes down next turn, that makes all this spot removal, like Lightning Bolts and... Uh, Frost charge, you know, it's stuff that uh, targets a single minion just uh, become yep. way less valuable yep. when you get it from Yogg. And we already see Yogg coming down here. Drain life on one of the 1-1s, one basically what you said. Restore six health. That's, yeah, that's not very important. That's even bad. Model coil on the Void Walker? No. Forbidden heating doesn't change yeah, anything. And we are also running out of spells very soon. What does this do to mana? mana? That's kind of good. <laughs> Because now he can. Uh, yeah, he dealt with the Doom yeah. Guard, which uh, I guess. Like, the game was just lost if he didn't deal with the Doom Guard, but uh, he's, yeah, he's still dead. Still dead. <laughs> yeah, right. So, Yogg's Run, as many miracles we've seen from that card, that was not enough to carry Sixo in this game. But uh, that said, Six is still in a great position in this series. Ness taking that game convincing, convincingly, though, and if there is one deck that uh, could. Reverse sweep, I think that Sui is like a great candidate for being one of the best decks of doing so. Well, not against Rogue though. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, <laughs> seeing Six's lineup, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be an uphill battle. But these aggressive decks are, are you are you just better at punishing bad draws? Like, I would much rather sit with Sue in this position than, uh, than like ha having to reverse sweep with a slower deck, pretty mm -hmm. much. Okay, so. Sixo says, okay, first the Paladin, yeah. and I keep my Wildcat for the very end. I guess we also didn't see everything uh, from Sixo's uh, Rogue yet, so he probably also just doesn't uh, doesn't want to give information away, yeah. wants to concede this Rogue. It, do it doesn't matter at this point if you win 3-2 or 3-1, it's it's pretty much the same. Oh, well, it's exactly the same, so right. no idea. Uh, you can just take it slow. Yeah. And a pr pretty great hand from 602. Doomsayer on two is, or like just Doomsayer in your opening hand mm -hmm. is uh, the, the key uh, to this matchup, I, I would say. Pyromancer equality also being really strong. That's a, a two card combination. Uh, Doomsayer just gives you so much more time to set up. Oh, yeah, sure. All out the game. I mean, it's not that the zoo doesn't have ways to um, to utilize the mana, but yeah, I, I agree. The Doomsayer is very strong, turn two. Into Solemn Vigil Tens yeah. 3, of course. That's pretty damn good. And this is this is looking great, so just looking at the hands. Oh, yeah. I mean, everything is utilizable. The Loot Holder next turn, Keep of Uderman deals with all these big threats, Peacekeeper 2, and the other cards are also all playable, and that's the important part about the Paladin. Yeah. He has two tools to deal with the big minions that Sue could possibly play in the Keeper and the Alder Peacekeeper, yep. and he has two ways with the Pyromancer and the Consecration to deal with the small minions. Exactly. It's, it's definitely not going to be a quick game where uh, Sue just runs, uh, runs over the Paladin, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. We see, on the other hand, the Sixo still doesn't have access to heal, but that's something which is a little bit more important later. Oh, we see um, Sixo playing the 3 4 here to make in the Ingos 3 3. What do you think about this orange? Uh, I he, he just got super punished by the yeah. <laughs> by the defender of Argus. Then again, his uh, hand had no way of really dealing with that in Gang Boss. He, he made it so quickly. I would definitely have taken more time to think that through before I made it. Oh yeah. <laughs> and oh, yeah. Uh, seeing 
as it looks now. Yeah, I, I don't know. The Keeper of Aldevan felt kind of sketchy. It was weird, right? I mean, 4 minus 3, 4, and basically burning the effect against the turn 4. Uh, very possible defender for Argos. Interesting here. Um, I thought we could have seen a Consecration right there. To, because even if it doesn't kill the whole board, it sets up really well for the Pyromancer if you draw another spell with it. Uh, this way, he just gives like the the minions that would die from Consecration mm -hmm. like a bit of value to trade, like the Imp can trade into the loot yeah. order. But uh, I am i haven't played uh, uh, the Murloc Paladin at all lately, so maybe you have to be this conservative with your Consecrations and Pyromancers in the in the matchup. I'm sure that this is definitely something that Sixer practiced a lot. I mean, double Consecration also being it's like super insane. Consecration yeah. probably the, the strongest card against Zoo. Drawing it twice means a very, very big thing. Pyromancer are probably, yeah, on par, and he also got one of those. So that's simply insane. Yeah. So I've used it this, training with this race tree, sure. Probably also train the... Yeah, let's see up to. Interesting. Another M gang, I can see that. I, I, and then he uh, traces. Yeah, exactly. yeah sure. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, do we have to use that though, or can we. Oh, no, right, there's a taunted away, so we can't even go with Blue Jill Warrior plus Consecration. Um, just so insane. He just yeah. throws all the pieces being needed. That's. Uh, what I found, I actually tested some of the ends of uh, ends of Paladin. That's like somewhat similar in in this matchup, um, but uh, the problem I had with the deck was just that if you draw the wrong answers at the wrong time, like you can lose to any deck that's even like supposed mm -hmm. to be your even supposed to be like your best matchup, you know. Uh, but uh, I guess the Murloc Paladin does this like a little bit more consistently because mm -hmm. your Murlocs are actually. Okay, do actually put in work in this match. So, mm, yeah, I guess I would really like to see a tap first here, just yeah. to not run out of resources, and then deciding what to do. Mm, Ness doesn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's also fine. I mean, it really depends on what you think about your opponent's hand or what's your idea is and then yeah you have to you have to think how you do it the best and Ness maybe with a consecration I mean I don't know what he um, thinks about Sixto's hand but maybe he assumes that Sixto doesn't have ways to the I, oh board swipes. I, yeah I actually want to th th that's actually really interesting that Ness didn't see Sixto use a, uh, a sweeper on the on the last turn and uh, on this turn, he just used a consecrate. It, from Ness side of the of the game, like it could look to him as a six is being disconservative, just because he doesn't have access to that many sweepers. Yeah. Like he doesn't have the pyre, doesn't have the second consecration, and that's why he's waiting so long to play them. So he might feel like after he saw the consecration that he doesn't have the second one because he uh, waited so long to use it. Uh, I can definitely stand behind him. Uh, not playing around Consecration anymore because the Consecration already went out, so leaving all the minions up at two health, that's, that's definitely viable. Um, he has to assume that quality though, but that's okay. I mean, if it is the case, then that's the case. Um, yeah, but little does he know, so this Pyro Consecration is really <laughs> hitting hard here. Yeah. And also, even if this wasn't good enough already, he has tier on the following turn. Just oh, yeah. Like hard it's pretty much impossible for for the suit to deal with in, in an efficient manner. Like mo most of the times where you have to go through a Tyrion, you're, you don't have a big enough of a board to apply the rest of the pressure, especially not with 6 on 15 life. Yes, definitely agree there. Probably tap, probably tap playing some of these small minions with a plan to at some point play this Doomguard. Maybe after the Pyromancer dies, playing this um, Tentacles first and then being able to empty the hand um, without discarding any kind of cards. That would be pretty good. Okay. He was really looking for a mortal coil there, I think. So he... Because he has no way to deal with this Pyromancer. And uh, with the Pyromancer aboard, on board, he 
can't realistically pay car play the cards like Forbidden Ritual or Abuse yeah. Insurgent. But do you pick the uh, do you pick the runic? I, I guess you do, right? I mean, the runic is kind of a zoo card. You can also take the Corsair against Tyrion, but you don't know. Yeah, I, I would definitely take the egg. You yeah. you need to find cards here. Yeah, me too. And then just the two taunts. Yeah, sure. Works out well. Yep. Agree 100% with that play. I'm not even sure about the no ways to handle Tyrion. I mean, he has access to PO and abusive, so he can just send with one two into uh, Tyrion, and then he can just send the runic egg with the PO and the abusive sergeant into Tyrion. So no big deal. And uh, Paladin also won't be able to utilize the um, the weapon in such an effective way because um, the weapon is uh, basically uh, he's very low on life already. Yeah. Yeah. So. He chooses to go with a quality that turn uh, instead of Tyrion, which is, I, I guess, for ten. Place into it. <laughs> oh, that works. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's the heal we needed. Oh, and the second Doom Guard. Not basically a forbidden healing for a plus one card and a four four on the board. Sounds good to me. Now you've seen a Pyromancer and two Consecrations. This uh, forbidden ritual. It's only the second Pyromancer that really deals with it, so I like playing at that this turn. The question oh. Messi is asking himself is, uh, is a life tap worth more here than uh, an extra 1-1? One, one? And I think that definitely that the answer is yes. Oh yeah, absolutely, especially yeah. with the double Doomguard in the hand, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. You tap, you tap, you play the Tentacles. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely clear. Because um, no matter what it is, you try that the Doomguard just doesn't discard the second Doomguard, so you can get full value out of that one. Exactly. So the quality, okay, that doesn't matter that much in this particular situation. So what did you see? One blue jill, yeah. So get here now, sure. Has any more looks like yet? No, I don't think any. Oh, no, 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 I, no, I think that oh, blue jill no, okay. has been sitting in the hand from like the very, very, very early turn. Okay, sure. But still, you against the. Uh, Against Sue, you don't need to get that many uh, Murlocs from the anything can happen if you like stabilized enough already. Yeah. So. Well, this is so sick. This <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah this, this is actually real insane. Work. Like this is so crazy. Look at this. Wow. This this is so absurd. Mm. By the way, let me think. So this is this and this. Okay. Yeah. No sure. I mean, I'm not sure whether you would like to play a Doomguard. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so, because the only thing by playing abusive there, you... Uh, uh, like, you're only saving a 1-1, one -one because you could just sacrifice another 1-1 one -one into the Ivory Knight uh, instead of abusive, and this way, like, it increases the chance of discarding the second Doomguard by a lot. So, I would probably have gone for Doomguard before I went for the abusive, but... Well, so. even... I, even... even <laughs> Even before the power overwhelming play, right? It's uh, or what? Yeah, right. play? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Even about um, before the power overwhelming play. So he had five cards in the hand. So if he decides to play the Doomguard before playing abusive and power overwhelming, the only thing which can really go wrong is if he discards exactly the double power overwhelming. Yeah. So one power overwhelming and the second one that's twenty percent. It's it's very small. It's like a three percent chance. Um, so I definitely think um, Ness just decreases the chances of having a second. Doomguard in his hand, or a Doomguard in his hand now, um, from a potential 60 to really 33%. And Sixer, we've been talking about how Sixer was on the back foot the entire game, but he just turned around, went on the aggressive line, and won the entire series. Okay, so we see, <laughs> we see Sixer and Ness, and look at this uh, height difference. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Sixer is a very tall man. It's uh, Goliath against uh, David, but in this Goliath, <laughs> in this case, Goliath won. So, <laughs> yeah, so very well played there from from Six O, and I enjoyed listening to to the minds of two great players talking us through that as well. That was that was fascinating to talk to, but the or to listen to. Sorry, the thing I want to talk about though is Six O's lineup in this tournament is very very different from anyone else's. He has the the Malagos Druid instead of just the pure token Druid. Mm -hmm. He has any Finn Paladin. He didn't bring Warrior like. Either of you guys, like, do you have any insight into what his overall strategy is? Like, what he's looking to beat? Like, what he was expecting the meta to be? Like, why bring such a strange lineup to this tournament? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, basically, I have talked with Sixto beforehand, so before the plays, and I, he told me about his uh, lineup, and I was, I was also really wondering why he. Um, push this uh, warrior out of his lineup and what he's um, told me is that he thinks that it's kind of 
inconsistent in a way that it doesn't really have that great matchups and usually if your opponent leaves warrior up then he also usually has some kind of tools to soft counter the warrior so that was basically his his uh, train of thought in this case that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's working out for him, right? He's mm -hmm. been powerhousing through this tournament. There are some more conventional lineups that we're seeing in the top four as well. But speaking of the top four, our top four is now complete. So let's take a quick look at the bracket to see what our semi-final lineup is going to look like. And there you can see their progress through Ecop versus Fire at the top, having beaten Vins and JJ respectively in the quarterfinals. Oskaka versus Sixo on the other side is an awesome matchup. Team kill matchup and just a clash of two titans as well. Guys, this is this is what, like almost a dream top four, right? You have three players and you have that one potential guy that can just blow everything apart out of nowhere in Fire. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't really ask for a better top four. This is... Uh I, I can't really express how excited I am to see Sixo playing versus Oskaka. They are two of the players that I respect the absolute most in the entire right. scene. And they're also they're also playtesting together and know each other like kinda inside out. So mm -hmm. it's gonna be a lot going on in that match. And then we have Ecop established pro versus uh, Fire that's uh, tr coming here to prove himself. Right. We we have the the two semifinals of different stories. Right. We have the potential like technical masterclass on one side between the two fantastic players, and then we have like the old guard returning player versus the new up and comer on the other side. So two very exciting finals that I'm personally looking forward to. But particularly, I agree with you, Orange. Oskaka Sixo has potential to to be one of those Oskaka Tice type games from from BlizzCon, right, where it's just like absolute. Technical masterclass that I can't wait.